Rick was following his wife for the first time in his life. There was no anger yet. It would come later when he caught Amanda with the person she had come to the city for. He had no doubt that such a meeting would happen. Otherwise, why would she say she was going on a business trip that no one had sent her on? Rick learned that his wife's trip was not business-related quite by accident at a football match. By some unknown twist of fate, he ended up sitting next to Amanda's boss, the director of the Continuing Education Institute. Their close proximity, the uninspired play of the teams, and the good weather led to conversation. How is your wife's health? asked the director. Normal, as always, Rick replied. She's going to the city for a two-day seminar today. To the city? That's strange, but I didn't send her anywhere. She asked for two days off on her own account, saying she was feeling unwell. Rick, who had been watching the forward, gave a skeptical glance at his wife's boss. The man wasn't lying. His eyes were clear and calm. Maybe I misunderstood something? Rick muttered, suddenly losing interest in the game. On the way home, he agonized over what to do but couldn't come up with anything. Amanda behaved as usual, cooked dinner, and called the family to the table. In the evening, she packed a travel bag and went to the train station. Before she left, Rick asked which hotel she planned to stay at. His wife was surprised by the unexpected question but answered. After watching her leave from the window, Rick realized what he needed to do. He sat down at the computer, bought a plane ticket, and booked a hotel room. He told his mother-in-law and son that he was going to his mother to resolve some issues. He called his boss and took two days off. Arriving at the hotel, Rick asked to be placed as close as possible to his wife. The receptionist checked Amanda's reservation and availability. She smiled and said that he was in luck. There were two free adjacent rooms, which she would assign to them. I just asked you not to tell my wife about me. I want to make a surprise, Rick said in a conspiratorial tone. Yes, of course, the receptionist nodded. I won't say anything. Thank you, he said and went to his room. Rick felt like a spy. Although he couldn't quite understand why, he couldn't bring himself to believe that his wife was cheating, despite the obvious lies. When Amanda arrived, he was already stationed in the hotel lobby, hiding behind a large planter with tropical plants. He watched as she checked in, then followed her up to her floor. In her room, he pressed his ear to the wall and heard the sound of running water. Amanda was taking a shower. About an hour later, the door to her room slammed shut, and he quickly followed her. Amanda headed towards Nevsky Prospect, and Rick kept his distance, cautiously observing her. It seemed she had no particular destination. She was just strolling around. She stopped at a couple of cafes. Rick... Being a true detective, had to make do with whatever he could grab on the way. I don't get it, he puzzled. It doesn't look like she's meeting anyone. She's just wandering around. Strange. Why did she come here? Maybe her meeting fell through? Rick followed his wife all day. By evening, he was so exhausted from the surveillance that when she headed back towards the hotel, he sighed in relief. But doubt still plagued him. Could the guest arrive later in the night? In his room, Rick lay on the bed without undressing, trying to listen for any sounds. But, unexpectedly, he fell asleep. In the morning, he was woken by the sound of a health program on the TV from the adjacent room. The second day was a mirror image of the first. Rick once again followed his wife closely, but found nothing incriminating. In the evening, Amanda checked out of the hotel and went to the train station, leaving Rick with only the option to fly after her. In the morning, while he was still asleep, she used her key to open the door. How was the business trip? he asked. Normal, she replied. Everything was as usual. 
So, as usual, he thought resentfully. She went away just to wander around a strange city? But why? Discovering that his wife was lying was not easy. Even more unsettling was watching her hide the truth about the lie. Rick watched Amanda, who was trying to act as if nothing had happened, as though she had returned from a routine business trip. She undressed and went to the bathroom, emerging a quarter of an hour later with a towel on her head. Rick felt that she was putting on an act. Inside, Rick felt his irritation boiling over. He was almost certain that Amanda had gone to the city to meet a lover. The meeting would have happened if something hadn't interrupted her plans. Maybe she had noticed the surveillance. Having accidentally learned from Amanda's boss that her business trip was a lie, Rick flew after his wife and spent two days tailing her, hoping to catch her in the act. Nothing came of it. Amanda just wandered around the city and then returned. Rick couldn't understand why she was treating him like this. What had he done wrong? He had always been a good husband, trying to do everything for his family, took her and their child in, and even endured his mother-in-law in his apartment. He wasn't going to wait any longer and would find out the truth immediately. Amanda, what were you doing in the city? He started. What a strange question. She raised her eyebrows in surprise. I know you didn't have a seminar, and don't ask me how I know. I repeat, why did you go to the city? Rick couldn't admit that he had known about her deception before she left and had acted like an idiot by setting up surveillance. He should have cleared things up right away instead of playing the spy. Why are you silent? His voice grew harsher. Amanda looked at her husband wearily. Let's talk in the evening. I need to go to work. In the evening? Rick smirked. So you can come up with some plausible excuse? Speak up now. Amanda took off the towel from her head and started drying her hair. She was neither embarrassed nor frightened, only slightly annoyed. Stop stalling. Well? Rick insisted. How long have you been seeing him? Seeing who? Amanda asked, genuinely surprised. Your lover. You've misunderstood everything. I really didn't have a seminar. I just wanted to take a walk, to be alone. I need it. It helps me recharge. Recharge? From what? Rick didn't understand what she was talking about. It's hard to explain. I call it therapy in a foreign city. When negative feelings build up, you need to get rid of them somehow. I can't just unload them on you. A foreign city helps. It resets all the problems. What nonsense are you talking about? He said, bewildered. And suddenly, he thought that her words might be true. You see, Amanda continued, as if not hearing his objections, in an unfamiliar city, I feel like a tiny part, just a drop in the human sea. Compared to that, my problems start to seem small, they dissolve completely. What are you talking about? What problems? What negativity? We're a family, we share everything. Yes. But that doesn't give us the right to spoil each other's mood, Amanda replied calmly. What are you saying? I'm always ready to listen to you. Rick was outraged. I tried talking to you, but you said you were tired of my problems, that I always complicate everything and can't live normally. Rick didn't remember this, so he said that never happened. Of course it did. You even said you were tired of being my sounding board and that you had your own problems up to your ears. Rick recalled something similar, but it had been a long time ago. Day after day, he poured out his dissatisfaction with their son's foolish behavior, his mother-in-law's nagging, and his colleague's scheming, fully convinced that he had the right to do so. After all, they were husband and wife, one whole. You were right, Amanda continued, we shouldn't offload negativity onto each other. Some people go to therapists, 
and I found another way. Besides, I really love the city. I didn't think supporting your husband was a problem for you, nor did I suspect you were looking for a place to reset yourself. Where do you reset? In the hotel or right on the train? Amanda looked at him in a way that made him realize he had gone too far. The guilty don't look like that. To smooth over the awkwardness, he tried to make what he thought was a strong argument. How much money have you spent? You could have found a cheaper way. No more than I would have spent on a professional therapist, she retorted, frowning. At this point, Amanda was bending the truth a bit. Her last trip hadn't been cheap. Sooner or later, he would find out, and there would be a scandal. Rick was angry. He felt he was starting to trust his wife, but his irritation wouldn't let up. Since you're so sensitive, I won't tell you anything anymore. He declared, fully convinced he was punishing his wife by withholding his trust. Do me a favor, she replied in the same tone. Then I won't need to go anywhere. In that case, what kind of family are we? Why do I need a wife if she can't listen to me? If you can't think of a different role for your wife other than being a sounding board, then she really isn't needed. Well, we've talked it out, the husband stated. He was outraged by Amanda's behavior. Leaving the house, husband, and child to go off for two days and spend their shared money on it. You see, I'm venting my negativity on her. He grumbled on his way to work. What a wife! Left alone, Amanda pondered. In recent years, she had struggled to tolerate her husband. Work trips provided a chance to escape family problems. Wandering through unfamiliar streets without a clear goal, observing the city's hustle and bustle, sounds and smells, she felt the presence of something much more significant than herself. Looking at the indifferent hotel walls and the lights outside, falling asleep in a bed where hundreds of thousands of others had slept before her, she began to feel like a mere speck in the vast world, and her own problems shrank to the size of a grain of sand. The therapy of a foreign city worked unfailingly. Amanda returned home cleansed, calm, and ready to resume her work routine. But the truth was she had never left specifically for relaxation, believing it was impossible, her husband wouldn't understand, and she didn't want to deceive him. This time, she had deceived him for the first time, and twice at that. Amanda had gone to the city not for leisure, but to deliver a million dollars and save a loved one. Rick was anxious. He took out his phone and called his wife. When she answered, he asserted, you're not going anywhere anymore. Change your job. Starting tomorrow, I'm taking a vacation and going to the countryside, Amanda replied in the same tone and hung up. They say a person becomes like the place where they live. After a few weeks in the psychiatric clinic, Andrew had begun to resemble a mentally ill person. Soon, he would lose his grasp on reality, lose the ability to think clearly, and forget who he was. It was his wife's cruel, cunning plan that had brought him here. Andrew had no doubt the cause of this nightmare was the inheritance. As soon as he claimed it, everything started. It turned out that the specialized institution with intensive monitoring served not only medical purposes. How foolish! How irreparably foolish! Andrew kept repeating, rocking back and forth on his chair. His whole life had been turned upside down. He had a home, a job, a wife. And now he was in a place worse than death. He needed to gather his scattered thoughts and figure out how to get out of here. Memories drowned in the thick mire of tangled consciousness. His wife's birthday. Friends had come over. Lola sat next to him and made him drink for her. It was unusual. She could not stand drunk people. He didn't think twice and down one shot after another. He also remembered someone from the friends hugging his wife from behind and pressing her to him. This triggered an irrational surge of aggression in Andrew, and he punched the offender right in the face. 
They were separated, but he continued to shout and hurl threats. It was very strange, nothing like him at all. His wife administered an injection, supposedly to calm him down, but it only made things worse. An ambulance arrived, and he was put on a stretcher and brought here. What initially seemed like a misunderstanding had become a terrifying, endless reality. Andrew never regained his senses. Injections and pills plunged him into a depressed, sluggish state. It became clear that he was not being treated but poisoned. How could anyone be forcibly held in such a place in our time? He begged, demanded to be released, shouted, but to no avail. He tried to meet with the chief doctor, but he was denied that as well. He attempted to protest, to use force. But they would restrain him, give him another injection, and shove him into a solitary room with barred windows. After he calmed down, he was moved back to the general ward. Three days later, his wife came with a notary. Lola demanded that he grant her power of attorney over all his assets, including bank accounts. Andrew refused. Then his wife threatened that he would become a vegetable in this clinic, and she would take everything from him through the court, achieving a declaration of his incompetence. When Lola left, Andrew was furious. He screamed again and demanded to see the chief doctor. But the medical staff had clear instructions. They restrained him and threw him into solitary confinement. Amanda was at work when she heard the phone ring. She pressed the answer button and heard an unfamiliar voice. Hello. You don't know me. Does the name Andrew Johnson mean anything to you? Maybe. What do you want? The thing is, Andrew needs your help. Why didn't he call himself? He is in a psychiatric clinic and is unable to do so. Which clinic? I'll visit him. They won't let you in. The thing is, he's being held against his will. He thinks the reason is his wife, who wants to get rid of him. In that case, how can I help? I'm a nurse at the clinic. I can secretly smuggle Andrew out, but he needs a temporary place to hide. He's not in the best condition right now. He's been heavily sedated. Most of the time, his consciousness is muddled. If you can get him out, I'm willing to take him in. I can send you my address. Yes but I'm not going to do this for free. Understand, I'm taking a big risk. So, you want me to pay you? Amanda smirked. Is this a new kind of scam? They used to call and say a relative was in a car accident or in jail, and now the new trend is the psychiatric hospital. Amanda hung up. Andrew, what have you gotten yourself into? She whispered. They had once been very close, neighbors, friends. Amanda was three years older, a huge difference in childhood. Andrew used to say that when he grew up, he would definitely marry her. In recent years, they hadn't seen each other. He had moved to the city, but they kept in touch on social media. The phone rang again, and it was the same person. Amanda, this isn't a scam. Andrew truly needs help. In that case, I need proof, she replied. What kind of proof? I need to be sure you know Andrew and that he trusts you. That makes sense, but how do we arrange that? Amanda thought for a moment. Here's what we'll do, she said. Have Andrew answer three questions of mine. Take note. What floor did I live on? What was my nickname in the neighborhood, and what did he break at my house? Floor, nickname, and what he broke. Okay. I'll call you back once I have the answers, said the nurse and hung up. The next day, he called back and provided correct answers to all three questions. There was no doubt Andrew was in trouble. It was horrifying to think that a healthy person was being held in a mental institution with psychotics, being injected with mind-altering drugs. If this was his wife's doing, how did she manage it? It seemed she was a doctor. 
How much money do you want? Amanda asked the nurse. One million dollars. Are you out of your mind? I'm taking a huge risk, possibly my life. If I get caught, I'll be locked up too. Besides, I didn't come up with the amount. Andrew himself suggested it. He said a million was no problem for him. As soon as we get him out, he'll pay you back. Why does he think his wife orchestrated this? She came with a notary, demanding he sign some documents, and he refused. I don't understand how she pulled this off. She's friends with our chief doctor, either they studied together or were lovers. Maybe she paid him off. Strange. Where did Andrew get the money? He's just an engineer. Andrew inherited it from his uncle. All right, I'll find the money and a place for him to hide. Mom's house in the village is still available. It's empty now. We need to meet. Come to the city as soon as possible, before it's too late. Okay, I'll come on Monday morning. Send me the address and meeting time. The medic said goodbye and hung up. When Amanda arrived in the city, she checked into a hotel and went to the cafe for the meeting at the scheduled time, which was near a place she knew. Her phone rang. Who did you bring with you? She heard the medic's angry voice. Have you decided to call the police? I don't understand. What are you talking about? She replied, surprised. I noticed someone tailing you. Leave the cafe and head towards the Gostiny Dvor, then to the bridge. I'll watch to see if I'm right. Amanda did as instructed. The phone rang again. He's following you. What does he look like? The medic described him, and Amanda realized it was Rick. That's my husband. I don't know where he came from, she said with annoyance. Probably jealous. What should I do? Try to lose him. How? The medic gave instructions. Amanda tried to follow them, but Rick wouldn't let up. He stayed very close, seemingly afraid to lose sight of her. The medic called again. When are you leaving? He asked. Tomorrow. All right, there's no time today. I need to go on duty. We'll meet tomorrow. I'll send you the coordinates. They said goodbye. Amanda continued on, and Rick didn't come closer. He wants to catch me in the act, idiot. Amanda was annoyed with her husband. Not telling him about Andrew could be understood, considering it was an exceptional case. Her husband wouldn't have allowed her to get involved in this situation and give money to a stranger. But keeping an eye on his wife was beyond her understanding. Strange, why did he come to the city? Did he suspect something? The next day, Rick continued to follow Amanda, but she managed to hand over the money. She met with the medic at the cafe. He sat at a neighboring table behind her and discreetly took the package. Having completed her mission, Amanda returned home, anticipating a confrontation with her husband, who had taken on the role of a detective. Lola was eagerly anticipating the pleasure of the life she would soon be living. London, Paris, Piccadilly, the Champ Elysees, a house in Spain. The dream was just a step away, obtaining a court decision declaring her husband incompetent. The hardest part was already done, Andrew was in a psychiatric clinic and wouldn't be released until Lola had control of the property. Dr. Brown had been on a short leash since their student days. Back then, she hadn't married him only because Andrew seemed like a better prospect, having inherited a luxurious apartment in the city center from his grandmother. Lola viewed her first marriage as a trial run and planned to stay in it until a better option came along. Lola believed she deserved more. Besides her cultivated beauty, she had a sharp mind, a tenacious grasp, and a ruthlessness that broke down any barriers. 
She was pleased with the current situation, but was frustrated by the slow judicial process, which scheduled the hearing for the incompetency case only at the end of the month. The decisive step to have her husband committed to a psychiatric hospital was prompted by an inheritance that unexpectedly fell into her husband's lap. Andrew's uncle had died suddenly, leaving him not only real estate, including a summer house by the bay, but also shares in a large company and a substantial bank account. Lola didn't want to share all this with her temporary husband, so she devised a plan to get rid of him, involving the help of an old acquaintance. She and Brown had planned and executed the operation to detain the wealthy heir with little trouble, only the legal side remained. Since her husband hadn't given a voluntary power of attorney for managing the property, Lola decided to take the indirect route through the court. The moral side of the issue didn't concern her. After all, why would an ordinary engineer need so much money? He doesn't even know how to spend it. Lola didn't intend to keep him in the psychiatric hospital for years. She would sell the movable and immovable property, buy a house in Spain, and then release poor Andrew, handing him the key to a small apartment on the outskirts of Washington or in the suburbs. Her plans for becoming the owner of Spanish property were interrupted by a phone call. Brown called and informed her that Andrew had escaped from the hospital. Escaped? She asked, bewildered. I don't understand myself. He's nowhere to be found. We've searched the entire clinic. What do you mean, nowhere? Lola screamed as the full implications of what had happened hit her. Do you realize what this means? We'll lose everything. Lola, don't worry. We'll find him. The criminal was furious. Find him, or I don't know what I'll do to you. Lola brandished her invisible weapon, but inside, she already knew it was all in vain. The bird had flown out of the cage, and its golden eggs were as unreachable as stars in the sky. It's over. Lola collapsed into a chair and covered her face with her hands. What do I do? Clearly, the plan to seize her husband's assets had failed, but there were still options. First, she could capture Andrew and put him back in place. Second, she could eliminate him physically. No court would be needed. Oh, Lola thought. I should have given him a heart attack right away and avoided this clinic castle. Brown is to blame. He said it would be easier. No problems. And now look, here are the problems. The search for the escaped patient was unsuccessful. Neither Brown nor Lola reported it to the police and lay low. Two weeks passed. Early one morning, Lola heard a knock at the door. She opened it to find a young woman in a sharp suit with a briefcase on the doorstep. Lorena? The stranger asked. May I speak with you? Come in, Lola said, confused. Who are you? My name is Amanda. I'm Andrew Johnson's attorney, who is currently your husband. Lawyer Andrew? Lola asked with a faint voice. Where is he? I currently have no information about his whereabouts. He hired me to represent him in court and during the pretrial proceedings. What do you want? Lola asked, flustered. First of all, I've been instructed to collect Andrew's passport from you. May I do that? Lola hesitated. Do you have any paperwork verifying your authority? She asked. Yes, of course. Here is my attorney's license and a power of attorney confirming my representation of Mr. Johnson. It is not yet notarized because the passport is missing. However, the agreement between me and my client is in written form and holds legal force. Amanda handed over the documents. Lola reviewed the documents. They were dated for yesterday. She grimaced and remarked. Quick. Yes, I don't like to waste time, Amanda replied. So, where is his passport? 
I'm not giving it to you. He can come himself. Lola said bitterly. My client cannot come as he fears provocation from your side. He is not willing to meet you until the court date. Oh, he's afraid? Lola sneered. Great. Let him go to hell. You are speaking out of anger, the lawyer said calmly. I've been instructed to inform you, if you do not voluntarily hand over the passport, my client will file a police report for kidnapping, unlawful confinement in a psychiatric clinic, and harm to health. Lola was ready to tear this unknown lawyer to pieces. But the threat of a police report restrained her like iron pincers, better not to mess with it. She went into another room, returned with her husband's passport, and handed it to Amanda. Is that it? She asked defiantly. No, Amanda said, putting the passport into her purse. My client's second instruction is to take the apartment keys from you. With these words, Amanda swiftly pulled the keys from the lock and put them in her pocket. Lola could only open her mouth in surprise and gasped helplessly. The third instruction, Amanda continued, is that you must vacate the apartment within three days. If you fail to comply, a police report will be filed, as I mentioned earlier. Vacate the apartment? Lola exclaimed. Are you out of your mind? Where am I supposed to go? I don't have an answer to that question. I represent my client's interests here. I can only add that Andrew is determined, and the charges against you are very serious and punishable under several articles of the criminal code. If the case proceeds, not only Mr. Brown, but also you will face prison time, and it will be significant. Think carefully. Lola clutched her head, and Amanda continued. Currently, Mr. Johnson is inclined to settle this matter amicably. If you do not make any property claims and file a joint divorce petition, he will forget about the weeks he spent away. Otherwise, as I mentioned, a criminal case will be opened, and you will face the full extent of the law. What should I tell my client? I'll do everything, Lola said in a muffled voice. In that case, Andrew expects you tomorrow at 10 o'clock at the registry office in our district. He will have security with him. I mention this in case you have an overwhelming urge to organize another operation. See you. Amanda left the apartment, leaving the failed owner of the foreign property in a completely despondent state. That's it, Lola said to herself. The game is lost. Amanda's idea of becoming Andrew's lawyer had developed naturally. She had held the status of an attorney for five years, though for the past year she had primarily been teaching. Her shift in career was prompted by the corrupt practices she encountered. Most clients were not interested in honest, diligent defense, but rather in whether the lawyer could bribe the right people. First of all, questions were raised about whether she had personal connections in the district police station, the prosecutor's office, the court, or the bailiff service. The answer that she was working according to the law was met with bewilderment and pitying looks. Amanda had long been considering leaving the Bar Association. She was tired of paying contributions as the number of cases kept dwindling. It was a good thing she hadn't left. The lawyer's credentials came in handy, although, this time, they managed to avoid court. Andrew had no plans for revenge. He didn't want to punish his once-loved woman with prison. His only desire was to get divorced as soon as possible and forget everything that had happened to him. When Amanda returned from meeting his wife and said their plan had worked, Andrew smiled for the first time in a month and a half. Will she come to the registry office? He asked. She will. Where else can she go? Here, take this, passport and apartment keys. Thank you. I would have been lost without you. It was time to part ways. Two weeks had passed since the orderly had transported Andrew from the psychiatric hospital in the trunk of his car and brought him to the village. 
Almost all this time, Andrew and Amanda had spent there with her mother and son Billy. The grandmother and grandson lived in the village house every summer for a couple of months, tended to the garden, swam, and prepared for winter. When Amanda told her mother whom she planned to shelter in their house, her mother simply looked at her daughter and said, Do what you think is best. Andrew won't be a problem for us, and we won't be one for him. After the orderly called to say that everything was going well and they were already on their way, Amanda realized that a new chapter had begun in her life. She told her husband Rick that she was going to her mother's in the village. The relationship between the spouses was strained, and he didn't object, only grumbled. Figures, the rats are fleeing a sinking ship. Amanda wasn't offended by the rats, she deserved it. But she didn't understand why Rick described himself as a sinking ship. In the past, she would have asked what he meant and listened to another story about his difficult trials in the career sea of big business. But this time, she didn't want to start a lengthy, unpleasant conversation. She avoided anything that might interfere with her mission to save her friend. All her thoughts were focused on how to return Andrew to a normal life and protect him from those who aimed to destroy him. Nothing, Amanda thought about her husband. He's not a child, he'll manage. It doesn't seem like a shipwreck. Just a little rough sailing. After the argument about her trip to the village, Rick hardly spoke to her. Amanda didn't know what had happened to him in recent days. He was probably exaggerating. With no one to share with, he was bursting at the seams. As she was preparing to leave for the village, she had an intuitive feeling that she wouldn't be returning to this apartment. She called a taxi, said to her husband, goodbye, and left her home. When the orderly brought Andrew, Amanda was already there. Seeing her old friend, she barely recognized him. He had lost a lot of weight, was slow to think, and spoke inappropriately. But there was joy in him for finally being free. It took him almost two weeks to recover and fully regain his composure. During all this time, Rick hadn't called once. Well, let it be, Amanda told herself. Let things go as they will. The most important thing now is to give Andrew his life back. She didn't want to think about her own life falling apart. She didn't dream of starting new relationships with an old friend. Was it worth stirring up the ashes to look for embers of a dead fire? Amanda's mother looked at her daughter with wise eyes. They had never kept secrets from each other, except for one, who was Billy's father. The plan had worked perfectly. Andrew's wife had signed the joint divorce petition and vacated the apartment. Andrew immediately began renovating it, wanting to erase all traces of his past life as quickly as possible. He returned the money for his rescue, and Amanda deposited it into the family account. She herself returned to the village from Washington. She needed a break to figure out what to do next. One morning, she sat on the porch, watching her son watering the strawberry beds. Her mother approached and sat down beside her. Billy looks very much like his father, she said thoughtfully. Which one? Amanda didn't understand. His own, Andrew. So, you guessed, her daughter smirked. Yes, as soon as I saw them together. They even have the same gestures. Tell me, why didn't you marry? You know, Mom. I never took Andrew seriously, he's younger than me. We didn't have anything, except for that one time. He came during the summer after his second year. It was all just a coincidence. Does he know? No, I didn't say anything back then. He went to the city, still had a lot to learn, while I had already finished university. And I didn't have any particular feelings for him. It seemed foolish to call and say, marry me, we're going to have a child. Well, that was a mistake. Look at how poorly he ended up married. He almost disappeared. 
Did you say anything this time? No, I don't want to complicate things. Look how fate turned out, sighed the mother. Will you return to Rick? I will. I think he needs me. He has some problems. All right, decide for yourself, and we'll stay here with the grandson for now. Amanda opened the door with her key. Rick was home. He looked at her grimly and said, Hi, I didn't expect you. Why? You withdrew money from the account. I thought you weren't planning to come back. I returned the money, she replied, and went to the bathroom. She washed her hands and looked at her toothbrush, forlornly nestled in its cup. He hadn't thrown it away, so he must have been waiting. Amanda realized she missed home. She went to the kitchen, turned on the coffee machine, and made herself coffee. Would you like some coffee? She called out to Rick. Yes, he replied. There are some cheese pancakes left on the stove. Help yourself. You must be hungry. Thanks. It was surprising. In her absence, her husband had started cooking. Amanda made a second cup of coffee and went to Rick. How was it in the village? He asked. Fine, Amanda paused. How's work? The position was eliminated due to cutbacks. They're transferring me from management to a branch office. And you kept quiet? Amanda was surprised. In the past, he would have nagged her endlessly. What's there to say? Nothing will change. It's a crisis. Rick, I've decided to leave the law firm. I realized it's not for me. Do as you see fit. I'm not a counselor in this matter. The husband and wife sat on the sofa drinking coffee. They didn't know what the future held for them. Rick, I lied to you. I left to help a childhood friend. He's in big trouble. Billy's father? How did you guess? I saw you. I visited the village. Does Billy know? No, I haven't told them. Both of them? Yes. Why? I don't know. Maybe I want to keep the status quo. And you? You should have told me everything from the beginning. I was sure you'd try to stop me and I couldn't not help him. You would have made me choose between you. Have you made your choice now? Yes. Rick got up from the sofa, took Amanda's empty cup, and went to the kitchen. Do you want me to heat up the cheese pancakes? He called from there. Yes, please, she replied. If the mast is broken, the ship doesn't sink immediately, it drifts in the turbulent waters for a while, hoping the wind will carry it to shore where it can cut down a tree and make a new mast. Or, at least, some oars.